That last tune was written by Becky Mello and uh, got a great, great message in it. I also want you to know that I have some great friends in the church that gave me a birthday present or a Christmas present, maybe Christmas, yeah. Four harmonica lessons with Roger, and I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, and you're going to say, oh, my, ain't that something? Isn't that something? Well, it's great. Uh, it's a great morning, and it's a wonderful bunch of music that points so strongly to the whole purpose of Jesus Christ coming into this world. And to think about one drop of blood, if you listen to those words, thought about the times when you cursed him, thought about the times when you got so juiced that you just had to sleep it off in shame, thought about those times when you lived your life absolutely apart from God Almighty, and then one day, somehow, some way, somebody reached you, Somebody loved you, somebody prayed for you, somebody knew what a mess you were but loved you anyhow and persuaded you that God knew all about you and loved you anyhow and that caused you to come and make your commitment to Christ. Now, this section that we're in, part two of this message, and by the way, forgot to tell that first crowd the assignment. You're to read John chapter 6 through 21 this week. You don't have to read all that every day. Just to get all that read th through the week, if you will, please. But I just uh, remind you that uh, last week we talked about what John's purpose is in writing this Gospel of John and how it ties to another thing, the matter of inspiration. I believe in inspiration of the Word of God. I don't understand it, but I believe it. Because you see, when Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, he started out by saying, here's why I'm writing. John writes the Gospel of John. He waits till the tail end of the thing and says, this is why I'm writing. And you heard Don read those verses to you so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And believing on him, you would have life through his name. There's the purpose laid out. And he builds this whole thing around seven particular significant events that had great meaning to the Jews because they had a thing about numbers. Number seven was the perfect number, signified perfection or completion. And each of these seven are rooted in the Old Testament understanding of who the Messiah is and what he was going to come and do. And the point that John is making is that Jesus is perfect and complete. He alone offers eternal life. I read you this little quip from Colson's new book, How Now Shall We Live? It's not out yet, but it's coming soon. And here's what he said. Only Christianity provides a sustainable, rational view of life. Nothing else provides the way out of the human dilemma other than the Christian gospel. You think about the human dilemma. You think about Atlanta this last week and the human dilemma. You think about a guy going just nuts and doing a thing and then being much more now a suspect of those early murders that were done in his first with his first wife and her mother. The human dilemma. People get trapped. Just had someone telling me a story last night of a, of a friend of a family. I have a pastor in my home for this week from Erie, Pennsylvania. He was telling about this, this beautiful girl that left home and got entangled with a crowd that's into drugs and the uh, man she was shacking up with came to the end of his rope, committed suicide. And then she was all shook up and she went to one of those fortune tellers. And the fortune teller said that he was saying to her, come and join me. And she took her life this last week. And when you, when you think about what's going on in the human dilemma, people trying to figure out this thing called life, what the Sam Hill is it all about? I didn't ask to be here, but I'm here. I can't get out alive. What do I need to be doing? Jesus came and laid that out clearly, and that's what John wrote about here in this book called The Gospel of John. A quick review. Three 
miracles we did last week. Number one, the water to wine. And Jesus proving that he's the source of life. Number two, healing of the son of the government official. Jesus, the master over distance. You remember the guy came 20 miles, walked and found Jesus and his kids back home 20 miles away. He said, Lord, if you'll just come and heal my son. And Jesus said, I don't need to come to heal your son. Your son is well. Go on home. And the guy believed and went home, met the servants on the way home. And the servants said, he's doing fine. He's doing wonderfully well. And he said, when did this happen? And they gave him the hour. And he said, that's exactly when Jesus told me that my son was well. Hallelujah. Let's go home and rejoice with our kid. And thirdly, the story of the crippled man at the pool at Bethesda. You know, if the pool wiggled... The water wiggled and you got there first. You were healed. When Jesus said to this man, do you want to be healed? That comes under my book, Dumb Things Jesus Said. Do you want to be healed? <laughs> and the guy proved something. He said, yes, I don't have anybody to help me. See, he told us something. He really believed that he could get there first. He would be healed. But he had nobody to help him. 38 years, his second tire dragging him down, dropping his body there every morning, coming to get him at night. They're going to stick around all day to try to throw him in first. But he really believed if he could get there first, he would be healed. And Jesus, once again, showed that he's the master over time. We didn't need any wiggling of the water. We just needed Jesus to say, stand up, take up your sleeping mat, roll that baby up, and get on out of here. And he went to the temple and praising the Lord. Jesus proving again. He's the master over timing. Four more today, quickly. In chapter 6 of the Gospel of John, we have this great story of the feeding of the 5,000. I always have loved this story because it has a little humor sprinkled along it. A lot of folks don't find any humor in the Bible. But if you look, you don't have to look real hard to find that Jesus had a great sense of humor. And, and if you read all of the accounts of these stories, if you tie them together, you really see the length and breadth of the humor. And here they are, they've got this great crowd of people following Jesus wherever he went because they saw his miracles as he healed the sick. And Jesus went him up into the hills and sat down with the disciples around him. And it was nearly time for the annual Passover celebration. But Jesus soon saw a great crowd of people climbing the hill looking for him. And he turned to Philip and asked him a question. And he was testing Philip. He said, Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? And then old Philip said, man, it'd take a small fortune to feed them. There's no way we can't scrape together enough money to go get food to feed them, let alone how much time would it take to get to a place and get back. And then Andrew. I, I think Andrew was just kidding. Andrew said to the Lord, well, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what is that among so many? If he really thought it was nothing among so many, why did you bring it up? It was kind of a ho-ho. Well, Lord, here it is. You got the five loaves and two fish. Well, what do you think about that? And Jesus said, bring it here. In some of the accounts, he said, well, no, Lord, I, I bring it here. And he brought it there. And Jesus said, all right, have them sit down. Amazingly enough, in some of the accounts of this, it says, the disciples said, where are we going to find any food in this desolate place? And when Jesus told them to sit down, he said, tell them to sit down on the grass in groups of 50 and leave aisles so you can walk between and distribute the food. Well, when, when you are negative, buddy, you are negative. huh? You see nothing but dirt when there's grass. You see there's no way when there is a way if God is there. And he had them parked there and Jesus took that kid's lunch. Oh, I think about that kid. You know, you think about things you want to do when you get to heaven. I want to sit with that kid and talk to him about that deal. How he talked the rest of his life, every, everywhere he went. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you about the 5,000 men, plus the women and kids. Had to be 20,000 people there. And he took my lunch, man. And he broke that bread and prayed over it and started divvying it up. And he broke up those fish and gave them. And we had 12 baskets full left over. 
Everybody was sufficiently fed. Nobody was shortchanged. It was an incredible, wonderful time. Then they picked up those 12 baskets. I don't know why they picked them up. See, you need a smarter pastor than I am because there's a lot of things I don't know. I don't know whether they're just tidy. That's nice. I don't know whether these disciples needed a bag full to take home. I, I don't understand all that, but, but there was plenty. Part of what we need to understand when we're going to do business with God, he's got plenty of resources. You're not going to come out just barely squeaking through if you will commit your way to him. He can cover you sufficiently. Well, you know, they finished this whole operation of the feeding. Everybody had enough. And then these people, they're, they're just so hard to satisfy. They, uh, come here. Ever have page one open for you? It sounds like I never read my Bible when I do that. And that <laughs> kind of bums me out a little bit. <laughs> but here these people are, and they say to them, after Jesus has said, the only reason you're following me around is to get fed. See, welfare is welfare is welfare. Don't ever forget that. You feed them once for free, they want back for a little more and a little more and a little more. And when Jesus said, the truth is, you only want to be with me because I fed you, not because you saw the miraculous sign. But you shouldn't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your money seeking the eternal life that I, the Son of Man, can give you. For God the Father has sent, you, sent me for that very purpose. And they got real pious. And they said, what does God want us to do? And Jesus said, this is what God wants you to do. Believe in the one he has sent. And they said, show us another miracle. I mean, you just know he wanted to slap them upside the head. <laughs> I've already just done this deal with the 5,000 men, women, kids, the whole deal, out of a sack lunch. Now you want, show us another miracle. You may be looking for the same kind of thing. You may be sitting there a long ways from God. You've never trusted him. You're not sure you can do anything. And what you want is to see one more miracle. I'll tell you something. Come tonight. Come tonight. Listen to the testimonies. You will hear the testimonies of the miracle of God Almighty in the lives of people who absolutely had nothing to do with him but that one drop of blood that they trusted in brought them salvation. Come tonight. And listen to that. And find out what God wants to do in your own soul by you opening yourself for him to bring his message home. See, this crowd didn't want a message. Jesus said to them, after they had said, well, Moses gave our people manna in the wilderness. And Jesus said, I must tell you something. Moses didn't give you anything. My father in heaven gave that manna from heaven. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. I am the bread of life. There's that other declaration. I am the bread of life. Here is Jesus saying that you cannot get sustaining life without him. Simply put your trust and your faith in him. Next, the five, number five, the miracle out there in the ocean. Tell you something, every expert that I've talked to about the Sea of Galilee, which you can see all the way across it, up and down on a clear day, but I am told that when that wind comes through that pass at the north, it can stir that thing up in such a hurry that you think you're going to lose your life, and many have. The disciples are out there on the Sea of Galilee there in John chapter 6, in verse 8, 16, and they uh, headed over there because Jesus was off praying somewhere. Ever think about the time Jesus went off praying? I, I think about that a lot because he spent a lot more time in prayer than I do. And I think about him needing to pray a whole lot and me having a hard time deciding that it is that important in my life. That's a little pastoral confession for the morning so you can take that and do something with it don't hide behind it but just take it and understand 
that to think about how much time he spent in prayer with his father. And so the disciples, they got in the boat and headed out across the lake. And soon a gale swept down upon them as they rowed, and they saw a very rough sea. And they're three or four miles out when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat, and they were terrified. He called out to them and said, I'm here. Don't be afraid. And they were eager to let him in, and immediately the boat arrived at the shore. Immediately the elements were controlled by Jesus Christ himself. Here's proving one more thing to them. He's proving to them that he is the master of the elements. He can handle whatever storm there is. Whether that's a physical storm or a spiritual storm, he can handle it if you'll simply let him. If you will confess, as Peter did in that passage, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We have nowhere else to go in order to find our way to eternal life. Number six. In chapter 9, Jesus healed the man who was blind from birth. When Jesus came up there and looked at this fellow, he saw a man who had been blind from birth, and the disciples asked a question. Why is this man born blind? Was it a result of his own sin or those of his parents? Now, when you examine a thing, just think about it. For his own sin, he was born that way. What sin did he do before he was born? Kick around while he's in the womb there and cause mother pain? What did he do? What could he have done? And yet they say, you see, there was that, there was that notion. Read the book of Job. There's that notion that if you've got a problem, a physical problem, you have committed some kind of sin, it's all your fault. You read what Job's comforters said to him, man, they were all over it. Saying, fess up, Job. You've done something really naughty. Now, come on, tell us what it is. That's why your kids have all been killed and you've lost all your stuff and you're sitting there with boils all over your body. You're a stinking mess. You fess up. Because that's the way they thought. And here Jesus says, no, it's not this man or his parents who sinned. He was born blind so the power of God could be seen in him. All of us must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent me. Because there's little time left before the night falls and all the work comes to an end. But while I'm still here in the world, I am the light of the world. And after he made that great statement, I'm the light of the world, he spit on the ground, he made a little mud, he slapped it on that guy's eyes and said, go down and wash. Now, I think, what in the world? There were times when he just spoke to people and said, be healed. And the guy could see. Another guy reached up and touched his eyes and pray over him and he could see. And here is this muddy faced guy. And, and somebody has said that's how denominations were born. There were the speakers, there were the touchers, and there were the spitters. <laughs> And can't you just see, can't you just see these three blind men, stand, formerly blind men, stand up and look at out over Jerusalem? And the guy said, wasn't it wonderful when he touched you? Never touched me, man. He just prayed. Well, you guys missed it all, man. He made mud and slapped it on my eyes. And when I walked, well, somebody's wrong here. This all can't be true because you got to have the mud. You got to have the touch. You got to have the prayer. See, we get so locked in thinking God can only do things one way. God has a jillion ways to do what he wants to get done if we'll just trust him. You hear this fella? He's, he's healed. He knows he's healed. And all kinds of problems start now with the Pharisees because this thing's done on the Sabbath day. They had no concern. They absolutely cared little for anybody that wasn't keeping all of the laws they'd spelled out. Keeping the law is more important than the compassion of healing. I think sometimes we find ourselves more interested in the keeping of the rules than we do bringing the compassion of Christ to people who are lost. 
There's got to be a reason why we're not doing the job God has called us to do. There's got to be a reason why most of us in this room did not personally speak to anyone this week about their condition before God Almighty. There's got to be a reason why if we say, yes, I believe John 20, 30, and 31, and yet I've done nothing this week, there's got to be a reason why. And my question to you this morning is why? Why do you persist in living day after day after week after month after year without being involved in the work of God Almighty by confronting people concerning their souls? What kind of fear can overcome you, cause you to stop short of letting a man know there's a way to find eternal life? There's a way out of the human dilemma if we'll but take it. I am the light of the world and he still is and finally he did the big one he raised Lazarus from the dead well what a deal that was Jesus stood before he raised him from the dead and made this kind of statement I am the one who raises the dead and gives them life again anyone who believes in me though he dies yet shall he live he is given eternal life for believing in me and shall never perish. I've used that verse over and over and over again in recent weeks as I've done a series of funeral sermons and talked to people about the hope that there is in Christ. Jesus laid all of that out before he said to them, okay, roll away the stone. The family looked at Jesus and said, Lord, he's been dead four days and he really stinks. Don't roll the stone away. Jesus said, roll it away. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. Remember a preacher saying long years ago, I was a kid when I heard him say this. If Jesus had not said, Lazarus, come forth, if he had just said, come forth, boom, the whole crowd would have come out. <laughs> Why? Because he has the master over death he has power over death itself and he can bring back from the dead those who have died and he can and he will and he will absolutely keep his promise you see it was this miracle that led directly to the plot to kill Jesus and Lazarus you got to kill Jesus because he did the miracle and you got to get rid of Lazarus because here's this living proof walking around saying yeah buddy I was dead as a hammer yeah, man, I stunk like old Billy-o. Yeah, and Jesus came along and said, roll it away and said, Lazarus, come out of there. One of the great tunes. You've never heard Carmen do his tune on, on Lazarus. It's one of the great tunes written, one of the great stories written and sung. Lazarus. Hmm. Oh, it's beauty. See, when we think about death, and think about Jesus saying, I have got power over death, trust me. Then you understand why they got so shook up there in the religious world in Jerusalem. Because here's a guy, it was one thing for them to have the battle of words that they had. It was okay. Absolutely okay. For them to kind of stand off with one another and argue about things. But when he starts raising people from the dead... That's another story. And that guy is walking around. They said, we got to kill both the guy and Jesus. Now, folks, you remember that Jesus had made a statement, and they played right into his hand. He said, kill me, and in three days I'll be back. Sure enough, they killed him, and in three days he was back. We say we believe it, but we're not doing much about it because we're kind of confused about how to get on with the work and how to be absolutely open to do the work and to see God as he really is. Little four-year-old kid was in our house this week. She's there pretty often because her mom is part of a Bible study that Roberta runs. Her name is Laura Scrivener. Laura's been going to five days of fun. And uh, Laura came home the other day from five days of fun and she was kind of moping around. Her mom said, what's the matter? And said, oh, nothing. And yes, there's something wrong, Laura. What's wrong? And she said, well, uh, I've got a question. A question about God. Oh, 
Kathleen said, fine, well, what's the question? Well, God's kind of bossy. Four-year-old. Well, what do you mean? Well, we've been learning over there at five days of fun that God says we got to love him more than we love anyone or anything. And it really upsets him if we don't do that. I thought, boy, what a deal. If I can get some 24 and 44 and 54 and 64 and 74 old people to understand that's true. God isn't bossy, he's just in charge. And if you want to know joy and delight as a believer, you allow him to be in charge and do his work. And if you're lost this morning, if you're still hanging out in the human dilemma, not finding a way out, I encourage you to pull a card out and fill it out and stick it in one of these boxes. We'll have somebody to sit with you with an open Bible, not to show you how to join Northwest Church, but to show you how to become a member of the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what people are going to be telling you tonight in those testimonies they give at this baptism time. Oh, my prayer is that the believers will wake up and get with the program. And my prayer is that those who are lost would acknowledge their lostness this morning and ask for help. Father, so easy for us to act like we don't need your help. So easy for us to say you're kind of bossy and refuse to allow this to take place. Oh God, how I pray we would think about one drop of blood. We would think about that we were on your mind when you were on that cross. And we would acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Son of God and have life through his name. Bless us as we go, we pray. Accomplish your purpose in our lives. Bless us as we read John 6 through 21 this week, just to simply find ourselves being immersed in the word of God and seeing what you've done to point this out. Bless us, I pray, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much. God bless you. Hope to see you tonight, 6 o'clock, for the baptism time.